Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm very happy to welcome back to the show, Rob Cook. Rob, welcome to the show. Good to hear from you, Bart. Looking forward to this. Yeah, you're kind of our, our expert on many different things, but uh, I should say you've been in the drum industry since the late 70s. You're the owner of Rebeats, which you have uh, authored and published many great history books um, for drums, and you also run and operate the Chicago Drum Show. So you are mm-hmm. kind of the drum the drum guru, the godfather. <laughs> well, I, I try. Part of it is just being alive this long. If you're in the industry for 30, 40 years, you become one of the old experts. And if you you don't talk too loudly, you can just pretend to be a sage old uh, master. <laughs> Yes, you are a sage old master. So um, today's topic, though, is is really interesting because I think there's going to be a mix of people who uh, we're talking about the PV Radial Pro drums, um, which super unique drums. I don't know, minus what we've talked about a little bit. Like I, I, I try to selectively not um, learn too much beforehand, but these are really unique looking drums. Um, when I think of them, I think of the drummer for Eve Six playing them uh, growing up, and I should have looked up his name and info, but there's just like those those um, ads are in my mind. But um, before we start, let me pause and say just to everyone listening, if I sound different, I have just moved into a new house, so I am sitting in kind of an open, empty, extra bedroom right now with all of my gear on a desk, um, surrounded by packing um, you know, boxes, and I've got a packing blanket kind of teepeed in front of me to try and help with reverb. Um, But so if I sound different or if you hear different noises or dog barking kind of stuff, bear with me. Um, So uh, anyway, all that being said, Rob, why don't we jump right in and you explain your um, involvement with these super interesting PV drums? Well, is it okay if we jump back and start with the first generation PV drums that yes we, I didn't mean to misspeak yes yeah, start us just when did how did PV get involved in drums in the beginning well um, I, I want I want to uh, try to put it in context for folks so they understand uh, how important this this was an important part of my life back in the day but I I uh, started in business not to tell my whole life story but in 72 and there was a small Christian bookstore that had a few musical accessories and so on a history in town of providing a few instruments and you know picks and strings and ukuleles etc uh, I I grew out of that um, two music stores Cook's music stores in Alma and Mount Pleasant Michigan towns of 10,000 and 20,000 and uh, pretty much from nothing grew these two stores we also had two Christian bookstores ultimately in two different locations aside from the music stores. But these music stores were what they called combo shops in the day. They weren't full line, full line being uh, orchestral instruments and uh, organs and pianos and all that. But combo shops were hot, were really hot in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s in, in the United States. And that was guitars, amps, drums, PA gear. Um, I was particularly interested in and and most qualified in the areas of PA gear and drums. So, uh, and remember, uh, you know, 70s, 80s, there was no internet, there were no box stores. Uh, Musicians went to music stores to get everything from drumsticks to drum lessons, uh, uh, the rumors, uh, find out who was in what local band, et cetera. Uh, you can kind of get a feel for that at the Facebook page, which uh, has been set up for Cook's Music. I set that up a few years ago. And, uh, and just, you know, it hasn't been in business for over a decade now, uh, even under another name. I sold it in 95, but still there's a lot of interest because uh, a lot of people, you know, local musicians in Central Michigan kind of grew up there. Um, so we built it up and, and started getting franchises and, and the way it always worked with the, the bigger, the name brand, the more sophisticated of an arrangement it was, but generally it meant a regional sales rep from the company would come in, look over your facility, see if, you know, it made sense for them to sell to you and take pictures of your storefront. So they weren't, they could. Uh, show the head office they weren't setting up some guy in his basement or garage who was going to 
upset the apple cart in the in the region and all that. Yeah. So um, we had franchises, and we're dealing with uh, Ludwig, Rogers, Slingerland, uh, Pearl, Gibson, Fender, Marshall, EV, JBL, Yamaha. We had a lot of good names, and uh, Bose. Uh, anyhow. Uh, Petey started to eat our lunch in the probably mid to late seventies. And it became an increasingly important franchise to try to get. And as it turned out, they had multiple franchises because they had multiple product lines. So you could be a PV dealer for guitar amps and not be able to get their PA gear, et cetera. Hmm. Uh, so I would, I had, uh, customers that, that wanted a Marshall stack and a Gibson Les Paul and a couple of twin reverbs, but uh, the reality of their budget made them go to my competitor. The closest PV dealer was like 40 miles away, and they could buy a whole stage full of gear for what you know I was going to charge them for a couple of amps. Uh, the, the, it was just crazy. A twin reverb was what, maybe $500 and a PV classic 212 is maybe 200 bucks or something. Yeah. So I, I became a, a PV dealer and we had separate franchises for the Alma and Mount Pleasant stores and different products. And, uh, I should man- mention that trans shipping was strictly forbidden. It wasn't like we could sell something that was franchised for one store in the other store or hmm. even have them pay for it in one store, pick up in the other or, wow. or sell to a, a non franchise dealer. That was a huge no, no. If a PV dealer, even from another part of the wow. state called and said, I need this power amp, but I'm not set up for it. Can you sell me one? You could lose your franchise. They, they, Jeez. they really kept track of this. Um, and we, uh, we got set up with PV and it, it was incredible. I mean, uh, anybody familiar with retail will know what I mean by turnover, how often your inventory turns over in the, in the year. And a lot of, for a lot of hard goods retailers, you know, maybe two or three times is considered really good, uh, for a small town music store with some, some outsized lines like uh, Alltech and Electro Voice and JBL and so on. Um, it, it was a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, so uh, to, uh, more of a challenge to get to the two time term. Uh, mm-hmm. PV was easily a six or eight time term. We, we wow. sold PV stuff as quick as we could get it in. And uh, PV was selling everything that they made and were in a back order status. It was it was like Ludwig was in the post Ringo days, the first surge, twenty four seven, shipping everything they could make. Uh, one thing that they implemented about this time, since everybody was crying for more product, was a scheduled order plan. So the the uh, rep would work with the regional. PV rep would work with the owner and myself, uh, and we would order six months worth of everything. We'd go through their whole product schedule, all the lines we were franchised for and every product in every line, and try to anticipate how many we were going to be selling over the next six months and month by month. And that would all be put on order. So, so then the plan was all this stuff is on order, just tons of equipment. Uh, and, Month by month, you would contact the rep or the factory and say, okay, here's what I want to discontinue. I want to cancel. Don't send me this and this and this. But everything else had already been on order and was built into their production schedule. So it, it did help at the beginning. Um, every month we got a printout that was, you know, the old tractor feed printers, these, these long combined multi-page printouts that were maybe an inch and a half thick, hundreds of pages. <laughs> so wow. uh, uh, we're set up with PV. One of the things they did also was a big NAM pre-show get together for PV dealers only. And it was a huge PV pep rally. Uh, Hartley and Malia would come out and, and pretty much convey that it was our patriotic duty to buy 
everything from PV and not very much from other people. And one of his, his lines, I'm not picking on him. The guy is brilliant and I want to encourage people to uh, go to the PV website and there's a tab to click on, uh, uh, documents or white papers. And there's a first person history of PV going way back. And the guy was a genius and he built a, a, mega empire i can't yeah. say enough about what pv accomplished but and that's uh, partly pv yeah obviously correct yeah yeah, yeah pv yeah. electronics and just pv.com uh so they would have these big pep rallies and talk about how a lot of his competitors were run by corporate sugar daddies but uh with pv you were looking at pv when you looked at hartley and malia and uh, that's why their stuff was so much cheaper because they didn't have to pay the corporate sugar daddies, you know, their corporate bonuses and hmm. uh, stock be concerned with stock prices and all, and all of that. Another thing he really hit hard on was made in America. I mean, he uh, built all this stuff in Meridian, Mississippi with local labor and everything was American made. And it was kind of our duty to, you know, support an independent company uh in in the american workforce mm -hmm. uh another thing they they did they had training facilities they what they were very concerned about that their pa gear and guitar amps and that sort of thing all the electronics that we understood the liability laws how to properly operate the gear they had a huge training facility in meridian and i at various times sent two managers down for a week at a time to uh kind of be indoctrinated in proper operation and safe yeah, operation yeah. Uh, yeah. so so that was pv uh the uh, l long about january or june of 84 there was a pre-show at a nam show and i i couldn't believe it because i hadn't heard any mention of drums and pv in the same sentence period but when we filed into this auditorium there on the stage were a couple of PV drum sets along with a bunch of other stuff. And it was kind of strange that, uh, they didn't say anything about it <laughs> most of the day. They kind of said, yeah, we'll be talking about these, uh, these drums. And they, they didn't spend very much time on it. For me, I, I was practically wet in my pants waiting to hear the details of who made these yeah. drums and where are they making them in meridian or and how much yeah. are they because everything else pv was legendarily the cheapest in the industry and a lot of the other companies were on the rocks at this point i mean uh, this was 1984 and and i uh, double checked to see where everybody was in 84 and if you think of the collapse of the American drum industry as a giant multi-car car wreck, the tires started squealing in maybe 81, that, you know, and, and Bill Ludwig was feeling it and, and it sold Ludwig to Selmer in about 81 and, and Slingerland started to slide. Rogers was having pro problems. Well, by 84, uh, that was the year that, uh, Selmer gave up on the Damon Avenue Ludwig location altogether, moved things to North Carolina, but at least they kept going. Slingerland in 84 was, was being forced out of their Niles factory and moving their distribution to Algonquin, which was not really a, a facility. And yeah. they, they were pretty much on the rocks. Rogers in 84 issued a memo advising dealers that all of their XPA shell production was being curtailed. They were regrouping and they had just pulled out of their, their venture into Mexico where the, the series two was made and everything. So all of the giants, uh, as far as American drum companies were, were really on the, on the rocks at this point. And it would be Japan who's coming in and taking over, right? Yeah. Yeah, Pearl was doing great. Yamaha was doing great. Uh, Tama was doing great. Um, so the, and, and I was at that time, I, uh, was having the same, uh, availability problems as everybody else dealing with Rogers and, and, uh, Ludwig and Slingerland. 
And, and I had joined that, that trend. I was doing Yamaha and Pearl, uh, later on Tama. Um, so that was, that was the trend at the time in 84 when this uh, pre-show showed the PV drums. Uh, so I, they, they didn't say much about them in the, in the pre-show. There was not much detail. They just said, talk to your rep about, you know, getting signed up for these. It's a separate franchise. So when I did the sit down at the PV booth, I, I ordered in, and I think it was uh, maybe six drum sets and 24 pieces of hardware, which to me at the time sounded like an awful lot, but it also sounded like the golden ticket. Uh, they they looked great, uh, and there there was very little detail. They, they did have a flyer, and it says that they're six-ply all maple shells, eight-ply on the bass drum. Uh, what really startled me was the castings, the, the bass drum pedal and the hi-hat had the PV logo cast right into it. Obviously, a lot of thinking had gone into it. it this wasn't a, a, a private label thing. These were, this was a whole new drum line, not a big drum line. They were like two kits and only two colors. You could get them in black or white and then that was it. Uh, but still, at the, the Pricing brought them in cheap, and I could just, I had visions of these bands coming in that would buy three and four PV amps. Now they were going to be buying, you know, PV drums. So I got them all on order, and they showed up on the, uh, the back order reports that, that started coming in monthly for a couple of months. And then they disappeared. I mean, everything, all the hardware. I mean, it had been three or four pages out of this printout that was all drum stuff. Just with the, because of the, all the different product numbers on all the hardware and everything. And it was all gone. Uh, no trace of it. And I, I called the rep to see if <laughs> something had gone wrong with their computer or, uh, something hadn't been announced or whatever. And he didn't have too much to say. He said that basically there wasn't enough interest at the show mm -hmm. there wasn't enough interest shown so they had decided not to do it <laughs> and i i just hung up the phone thinking this isn't right something's way wrong you to have those castings made i knew was expensive i didn't know how much because i wasn't in manufacturing but yeah. this this was a whole new world of drums and that that as quickly as it appeared it it disappeared before we keep going let me ask you this are these uh, they're not the famous like radial series that that has the you know otherworldly look to them at this point, right? This is right. like a series one that is more of just like a regular old yep, uh, yep. look drum set, right? Yep, yep. They just look okay. like a, a, like a new Pearl or Yamaha or something, a whole new uh, new new holders and everything, but but kind of box like tuning lugs that look kind of generic uh but uh people can take a look at them uh, i did come up with a uh, that piece of literature that they distributed at that show and uh tommy winkler is uh, still around and, and ends up he was the guy that developed those uh and he sent me some pictures of them but there are pictures at the uh rebeat site uh people go there and and click on uh podcasts and interviews by Rob Cook and it'll take it or uh, it'll take you to the page at the Rebeat site that has links to all of the uh, drum history podcasts that I've done and also a uh, link to uh, some pictures of the, the PV drums. Great. We'll link that in the notes for the show so people can get to that page quickly. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, okay. okay. So yeah, then, then what let's keep going from there. Um, well, uh, that was kind of the end of the story for a few years. Remember that was 80, 84. So probably by the end of 1984, the drums had disappeared from the back order reports and the only word, uh, was, uh, PB changed their mind and decided not, not to get into the drum business. So they, they simply disappeared from the back order reports and nothing more was said about uh, PV and drums. Uh, along about six years later, around 91 or 92, I happened to meet a, a guy named Tommy Winkler in Nashville. And 
the the topic of uh, PV drums came up, and he said, uh, "Well, that was me," and he <laughs> he explained that the the whole PV drum thing, all of that stuff I saw on the stage, all the castings, the drums themselves, the uh, everything shown in the literature, had been manufactured by Tommy. He had set up a company called the Tommy Winkler Drum Company, and he had an agreement uh, with Hartley PV. And the agreement specified that uh, Tommy would design and manufacture these drums and drum sets and ship them from his facility in Nashville, where he did the manufacturing, on behalf of PV. He was is basically a company whose only customer would be uh, PV. PV would rep would present them to in the marketplace, sell them. They would be shipped from Tommy, um, and that was the arrangement. Uh, and so they got all geared up, uh, introduced them at the show, and according to Tommy, immediately after that show where I placed that that order, which for me was a huge order. Uh, then Hartley came to Tommy and said, it's just not going to work for me to do it the way we had agreed upon. There, there was a purchase order in place. He had, he had a signed purchase order to Tommy Winkler for the purchase of these drums. But he said, I'm, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is have you move to Meridian, Mississippi, and we will set up you're manufacturing in a PV building and you will be a PV employee, but in complete control of the drum division and you will be paid a royalty based on the sales of the drums. Hmm. Well, Tommy, Weird. Tommy didn't want to do that. And he told me further that he knew of some other folks who had done similar things, like with the Black Widow speakers and so on, where somebody comes up with an idea, they're developing it as a company, Hartley would kind of buy out their company and pay that person to run it for him, basically as a division of PV. Hmm. Um, so uh, neither... Hartley nor Tommy were flexible at all. Tommy didn't want to move to Meridian, <laughs> Mississippi from Nashville, and he didn't want to, you know, take apart all of his manufacturing facility and reassemble it somewhere. Uh, it, it was just a non-starter for him, and it was just as much of a non-starter for Hartley. Hartley didn't want to budge. That was the only way he said that he would go forward. Yeah. Well, uh, so they they pretty much uh it was a standoff and pv simply decided they weren't going to do it at all took it off the back order reports and and walked away from the deal uh along about this time carl dustman had landed uh in on the nashville scene he had been with ludwig running the education department for over 12 years and uh left after it became a division of selmer and they kind of changed direction so uh carl was in uh nashville working for gretch uh same kind of uh position this was the the generation of gretch when it was owned by charlie roy charlie mm -hmm. roy had uh started had already been running custom in Chinook, Kansas, when he acquired uh, Gretsch from Baldwin, and he moved himself and custom all to, to the Nashville area and hired Carl Dustman to be the marketing manager. Well, uh, Tommy and Carl were friends, Tommy Winkler and Carl Dustman. Uh, Carl had borrowed a vintage Gretsch drum from Tommy to appear on their photograph, their uh, big fold-out catalog that they produced at about that time, 83, 84, and so on. So Tommy turned to Carl for help, uh, asked him if he had any advice because he was leveraged, man. He had, he had mortgaged his house, leveraged every, every dime he could come up with to get the loans secured 
to set up this manufacturing uh, facility that was going to be able to make drums on a scale, but he knew PV was going to be able to, to ship them. So then he was covering all of this stuff himself, like you said, mortgaging his house, knowing that he had this purchase order from Hartley PV, which then got yeah. pulled out from underneath him, obviously, because he didn't want to do that deal where he got brought to, you know, Mississippi right. and all that. Right. Wow. Jeez. Right. So, so he really was feeling like the rug had been pulled out from under him and, and the banks were coming after him and he was getting pretty desperate. So Carl started kind of consulting with him on, on the side. Or actually, this might have been about when uh, uh, Baldwin repossessed uh, uh, Gretsch from Charlie Roy and then sold it to Fred Gretsch. And, and Carl may have already left Gretsch because it got sold to Fred Gretsch. Anyhow, Carl was in Nashville and did some consulting uh, for Tommy. They made him a little seven page proposal on maybe how to form a new Tommy Winkler drum company and present it in the marketplace. But uh, that called for an investment of even more cash. So it was kind of going in the wrong direction there. Yeah. But, but something that, that Carl did offer to, to work with him on was a, as an effort to salvage the deal. And knowing that uh, Conway uh, Twitty was a personal friend of Hartley Peavy and also an endorser of PV gear and was a friend of Tommy. Uh, Carl talked to, to Conway Twitty and his uh, uh, business partner, Hugh Carden, and they came up with a plan to all go to Meridian to talk to Hartley. So Tommy Winkler, Conway Twitty, Conway's business manager, Hugh Carden, and Carl Dustman all get on Conway Twitty's personal Learjet, and they fly to Meridian, Mississippi. Uh, Hartley picks them up at the airport. They go right to the Hartley headquarters, and they meet in the in the big PV conference room. And nothing came of that meeting. Uh, Hartley just remained adamant that he did not want to move forward with drum product at that time. Now, in that meeting, there was no mention of the option of making Tommy a division of PV or anything. Hartley just took the position from the get go as soon as all these guys got seated that he just plain changed his mind. He didn't want to get into the drum business and that was it. He felt no responsibility for, uh, uh not any financial or legal responsibility to Tommy for, uh, you know, the purchase order. He, he just wanted out of it. Um, it turns out that Conway had also invested with uh, Tommy. And, and at that point, Conway offered to put more money in another hundred thousand dollars if they could keep this deal on track and float it because he was going to lose money otherwise. And he kind of felt that maybe on the strength of their personal relationship that that would help push Hartley over the edge, but uh, it, it didn't. Uh, the four of them got back on, uh, Conway Twitty's private plane and went back to Nashville. And that was pretty much the end of the story. Uh, the Winkler Drum Company uh, was sold off. The banks came. There was a bankruptcy. The tooling and the hardware, the office equipment, the bookshelves, everything went at a big auction. Now, uh, there's there's much more to the Tommy Winkler story, but that's for another day. And you might want to talk to him. He's a, he's a very interesting guy, congenial, and he's sure. got a lot of drum adventures to tell you about but that that was a sad chapter yeah and before uh, we move on i think most people over you know i mean i know who he is obviously but but just so people know conway twitty is a very famous like uh country singer um and that's why he has his own jet and everything but maybe people under you know 20 something don't know who he is he's very famous really great country singer um obviously a businessman as well but um mm -hmm. god before we move on to part two of this it's just interesting of uh i mean hartley pv sounds like like it's a little bit kind of like oh boy that's really kind of crappy to do to tommy but he's also a businessman and had a mm -hmm. gut feeling of like he went with his gut it's his business you know so you're kind of torn mm -hmm. on what do you think is right or wrong you know who's right mm -hmm. i mean he obviously maybe he could have stuck with the the you know the correct the purchase order, but um, something told him to not do it. So that's kind of a interesting position to be in. 
It it is, uh, but um, you can look at it a couple of different ways, and I I'm not going to be judgmental, but of course, but Tommy certainly feels judgmental, and he feels that he was set up from the beginning, and that uh, he didn't want to become a PV employee, but that was the end game all along, and it, it mm. kind of bit him. So. Yeah, well, we you know without speculating or saying one thing you know, right or wrong, we'll let people decide on their own, but um, yeah, well, it, it so, ties, it doves, ta- it dovetails in a very interesting way to the next story that we're going to get into. Um, should what we year? Yeah, mm-hmm. let's, let's move forward. But so what year, so all of this started in kind of 84, as we said with, mm-hmm. you know, the, the analogy of the tires falling off in 81. And then, so PV starts this idea in 84. When did it fully, you're on a sad plane back you know, to Nashville with Conway Twitty. When did they, when did that, when did it part one end? That was in January of 1985. Oh, wow. So this is about a year. Yeah. Within, uh... yeah, within a year, they introduced them at that NAM show, I believe in June of 1984. And by January of 1985 was that plane ride uh, to try to salvage the deal. Jeez. I don't know when the auction was for sure, but it was probably okay. by March of, of 85. Okay. So, all right, then <laughs> it's dead in the water at that point, but obviously there's a part two. So what happens from there? Oh man, uh, this was interesting. I felt like Forrest Gump being in the middle of this, this situation. <laughs> uh, uh, now about uh, seven years go by, we're in the spring of 1992 and one of my uh, good friends and customers had a little recording studio in a little town called Shepherd, halfway between the two towns where my music stores were, Alma and Mount Pleasant. So Russ McKellar had this uh, Blue Dog Audio studio doing mainly uh, church choirs and, you know, barbershop quartets and occasional rock band and, and that kind of thing. And I ran into him on the sales floor, one of the stores, and uh he said, oh, man, how about those new drums? And I said, wait, wait, what? And he had just done a session, and he figured everybody knew about them, and especially me being the local drum guy, but I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said that he had just recorded a demo for the new drum company uh, out of, I think they were Muskegon. They were over on the west side of the state somewhere, Holland, uh, Muskegon area. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, they're really different. They're they're, they're really kind of funny looking drums, but they sound great. And they, they, for some reason, came to my studio to do this demo. Oh, I know, I know why it was. It was because a local sax player, uh, Chris Bickley, uh, had a music store also in the area selling keyboards. And he was the one that suggested Russ's studio. And, uh, he was in, involved with the band that, I uh, had made contact with the drum company. Anyhow, they they did this uh, demo recording for Volk Drums. And so I uh, got uh, Stephen Volk's phone number from Russ, the owner of the studio, and I, I called him and introduced myself and uh, asked him if he had these new drums I'd been hearing about and if he was selling them or whatever. And he explained that, uh, yeah, it was a whole new concept that he had come up with. And he had some investors. There was uh, local businessmen around the area where he lived and a few bankers and lawyers and so on. It all chipped in. And he set up this little corporation and he was making these drums. And he was going to introduce them at the Summer NAM this, that coming summer in uh, uh, Nashville. And I said, well, that's great. I'm, I'm going to be exhibiting at that show. I didn't usually exhibit at NAM, but I did a couple of times and I had a booth reserved at that, that same show where Steve was going to introduce these drums. So, uh, I get to Nashville and I, I get all set up in my booth and I had his booth number written down. He would, and he was just down the aisle from me. Uh, so I get all set up. And I go down to the booth number I had, and there's some cheesy disco company or something. It's all imported uh, flashing lights and stuff. It was really weird. <laughs> and I thought, ah, something's gone way wrong. So I I uh, got to a pay phone, and I called Steve. And I said, uh, Steve, I went to your booth. <laughs> uh, what What's up? Did you move or something? And he said, well... Rob, I can't really talk about it, but I've signed a contract with a major southern manufacturing company 
uh, and we have an agreement in place, but we can't really talk about it. And I said, uh, at this point in time, I was only a year or two away from having heard this whole Tommy Winkler story. So it was fresh in my mind. And I said, oh, Steve, <laughs> tell me it's not Peavy. <laughs> I said, I need to tell you, before you take another step, I need to tell you a story. And uh, he said, well, it's, it's a done deal. The thing is, Rob, wow. th this is a radically new concept. And, and I'm, I've gotten all the backing that I could muster to go into this full bore. We've made 50 kits, and I can't afford to have some Chinese or Japanese company see what I've done, infringe my patent, because a patent is only as good as your pockets are deep. I can't afford the litigation of fighting somebody like that. This this is going to solve that for me. I'm, I've put my lot in with a company that's big enough to fight those guys off if anybody tries to steal it. And I said, well, but Steve, still there's some things you should consider about your arrangement <laughs> with whoever it may be. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and he, he really didn't want to hear that. So mm -hmm. they went forward, and I didn't track them too closely at the time because uh, about that time, we, we parted ways with BB. They weren't nearly as critical to the survival of uh, Cook's music as they had been a decade earlier, they had a lot more competition. Companies like Crate and mm -hmm. so on were coming on. And uh, so when, when we ran into some issues with our rep, uh, we just kind of pulled the plug on it. And I, I didn't miss it. I I could see, I, I went, I made a point of going to look at them at the next NAM show pursuant to our, our conversation. Or I guess it took, it took till 94. I think it was January 94. Uh, so Stephen Volk went to work for him in 93, technically, or on, on paper, signed that agreement in uh, 92, uh, went to work for him in 93. And in 94, January, PV came out with the Radio Pro series of drums. Uh, there was a certain amount of tension in some quarters because, interestingly enough, I, I wasn't aware of it till later, but uh, Pearl was distributing PV product. Uh, overseas, presumably Japan, but I, I don't really know the ins and outs of that whole deal. But there was a business relationship between PV and Pearl, and people were kind of on edge wondering if there were going to be fireworks because now PV was introducing drums, and uh, Pearl drums were obviously important to Pearl, and their distribution in the United States was important. So there was a, there was a little bit of uh, apprehension about what was going to happen so the the story I heard was that uh, Pearl's president, Tak Isomi, uh, goes over to the PV booth to see what these are all about. And he had a little entourage with him, five or six people, and they go over and they, they look him over. Tak looks at him uh, from all sides and expressionless, didn't say a word. And as they were walking back to the Pearl booth, finally one of his... Uh, uh, Aid said, uh, so what do you think? I mean, you haven't said anything. <laughs> and I, I'm told he said, hmm, looks like a woman with three tits. <laughs> so, oh boy. So there was a certain, and he wasn't worried. And that was kind of my impulse too. When I first saw him, I thought, well, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, they were priced pretty high. They were a premium drum line and with a whole new look and new theory. And uh, at this point, it's uh, worth mentioning again for people to go to the link, uh, the links at my uh, uh, page, and it'll take you to the promotional video that uh, Which PV, is cool. PV put out. Really well done. Yeah. Very, very professionally prepared and very accurately explains exactly what Steve was trying to accomplish with these drums. And it, it seems like a sound theory. Uh, Can you, before we move on here and, and on the Steve stuff, so just so people know, it's V-O-L-P-P, -P, Steve... Volp, correct? Yeah, Stephen Volp. He's on LinkedIn, and uh, there, he did a very interesting interview. It's almost an hour long, I think, with uh, with some PV Radio Pro fans as recently as 2016. And that'll give you a lot of insights into what went wrong. I think his concept 
was sound and he still believes in it and he may someday still do something with them. Uh, the patent now has, has expired. Uh, and PV ended up only, uh, producing them from 1994 to 2002. But I, I think it was by about 96 or so that the writing was already on the wall. There were, I, I wasn't privy to the difficulties that they were having that Steve mentions in this 2016 interview. So that makes it real interesting. The kind of, yeah challenges that they were having working as a drum division under PV. But what I did see from the outside was that uh, Stephen Volp kind of transitioned from running his own drum division to being a, a PV artist relations person. And, and I don't know if it was from some of the relationships uh, he had with, with, you know, groups like Van Halen and stuff with the drums that, that kind of, prompted that. But my observation at the time was, well, why are they moving the drum guy over to artist relations unless it means the drums aren't doing well? Yeah. But uh, the guy that became the product manager of the entire drum division was uh, Tom Rixkers. Now, uh, Tom, I knew really well. In fact, he, when he was applying for the job, he came to me and asked for a letter of recommendation. And I wrote him a couple page summary of all the things that he had done for me and what I thought of his abilities and so on. And, uh, and Tom got the job and ended up kind of running the drum division. And uh, I'd, I'd talk to him at NAMM shows and he'd tell me everything was great and they were going to be coming out with a series of marching drums and, hmm. uh, and so on. And, uh, but it, it did kind of, finally collapse and well it, it disappeared yeah. you know by 2002 okay. it, it it was just no longer there can you explain so everyone is on the same page obviously we live in the world of of google and everything so people have without a doubt looked up these radial drums but mm -hmm. i always kind of equate things like this to like um almost like like they're they're in no way the same or similar but like north drums where they're just a different kind of drum out of nowhere where it's its own mm -hmm. It doesn't look like a normal drum set. Can you explain these drums? Yeah, his his the the driving force, the concept that that drove Steve to invent these was that uh, hardware, mounting hardware, and lugs and all of that uh, muffle the shell, and he wanted to create and and also they have to be put on a shell that'll survive the torque of being. Uh, the tension of the head on it. So he wanted a very thin shell that could be very reason, resonant and get very low tones, but without any stress on it. So he kind of made a, a shellless drum, a big, a big drum hoop that could tension a uh, head and, and put it on top of a very thin shell and glued it on and then did the same on the bottom. So you've got, basically, you see nothing but a, a drum shell and then donuts at the top and bottom. Uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, interesting. And, and the, the video does a better job of explaining it and showing uh, the, the vibrations. And it makes sense. I mean, a drum sounds differently, a tom-tom, if someone is holding it uh, up for you just by uh, their fingertips on the counter hoop, but then grabs onto it you know you're you are in fact inhibiting the vibrations a little so th that yeah. was the that was the theory behind it uh, mm. they they were strikingly different and i i personally think maybe would have done better in a slightly different setting maybe as the high-end option as a division of uh pearl or sure. a, a dw or something rather than uh, an entry-level gambit from an electronics manufacturer. <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, it's like with PV, it's like these are our drums. They're super out there. If you don't like these, well, these are all we have, basically. There's yeah. no like, <laughs> all, and the snare is really interesting because it's like, I think the snare, if it was a normal snare, it would make the drums even look different. But the snare is basically like a, it's just, it's just a big, almost like, I don't want to call it a bubble in the middle, but it's a lot of them you see where it's just this mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. a rim and then it's just a big, huge, like thick band almost of, of wood. Um, they're yeah. unique. They're yeah. Very unique. Yeah. Which, and 
I don't even know if that goes on a regular snare stand. It doesn't look like it would, but <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 really out there, but I'm sure now. I mean, I should have asked the question: How do they sound? I mean, do they sound as good as any other you know high level drum set? They seem to, but I, again, I I didn't have direct uh, experience with them even. Okay. Um, but from everything I've heard, yeah, they they sound pretty good. I think uh, uh, Van Halen was using them, if I'm not mistaken, but. Uh, yeah, I can't really comment on on the tone. I clearly yeah. the tone wasn't superior enough to warrant uh, whatever negatives were stacking up against them with, and in the marketplace and resistance to the appearance and so on. I mean, yeah. if a, if a drum really was head and shoulders above anything else, audio wise, I think drummers would put up with a an unconventional appearance. Yeah, yeah it's it's not. In in any way, it's not an ugly drum, but it's just so different that you're <laughs> like yeah. it's it's kind of like I don't want to say uh, gimmicky because I mean we all have some drums and we've all seen kits that are kind of gimmicky, which are cool, but like it's it's sort of just a, a thing, you know, like this, this mm-hmm. big kind of bubble. And people I've seen online looking them up, they say this like otherworldly or like this alien looking drum set. They they do look very. Um, it stands out. I mean, it's very unique and, and I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of people who are very passionate about it. So I want to be very respectful yeah. and say they are cool looking drums. The, uh, yeah, that recording that, uh, Steve Volk did in 2016, which is, is very interesting. One of the things he mentions that as an example of how he was curtailed there. And he also mentions that the different divisions at PV, it, it was kind of a competitive situation. I mean, uh, uh Several of the divisions were in this this main building. I think they called it Building Three, and it was like a seven acre building uh, that just recently was uh, pretty much emptied by auction. They've, they've moved a lot of their electronics manufacturing offshore now, but uh, the different divisions were kind of competitive. And uh, he said the guitar people were pretty nice to him, and he got along well with them. But uh, it was kind of towing a corporate line and and one of the examples he gives where decisions were kind of out of his hands and it hamstrung him was at one point they they uh issued a dictate that there were going to be rims uh holders used on all the drums well the the rims patent was still in place so it was going to cost them some some change and uh for people that are familiar with rims the concept is similar you put a rims mount on your drum by fastening it or securing it with the tension rods and isolated with big rubber grommets and allowing the drum to vibrate freely uh so that's the real reason for a a, a rims mount not to simply find something that will work to hold your drum in place, which is what PV was telling Stephen to do with them. Uh, it was uh, kind of uh, being redundant to use a rims mount on a Radio Pro drum. It made no sense yeah. at all, but he was told that he had to do it. So it not only uh, aggravated him and defeated the concept, or didn't defeat it, but uh, made the concept redundant, Sure. But it, it also made him cost more. So that made it harder for him to make a profit. And that's what he was going to be paid on. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, because he had a royalty deal. Yeah. Wow. What I presume that, I presume that was in place. I should I should make it clear that I don't know exactly what kind of a arrangement that they did, in sure. fact, enter into. But I presume that it was yeah. similar to what Tommy balked at. Yeah. Now, what did a radial pro like? What did a you know, if you were out to go out to, to go out and buy a five piece kit, you know, shell pack, what would that usually set you back? I don't know, but I'm going to guess they were at the high end of things. Uh, up, uh, my guess would be up close to like recording custom at the time or something. Hmm. Uh, but because I do know that they came out with a cheaper series. I don't know the numbers on this different series even. It seems like it was 1000, the original, and then they came out with a 500 series. They okay. came in with some offshore uh, made radio pros and maybe even had some molded uh, rims uh, top and bottom mm-hmm. on those. But um, 
Yeah, I, probably even a lot of the the PV Radio Pro fans would be better qualified to answer. And and they're devoted and out there. That that 2016 interview that people should definitely check out if they're interested in and in, and in hear Steve's whole story was basically a conversation between he and a group of uh, loyal PV fans. It was at PV Palooza, a get together. <laughs> <laughs> and cool. a, bun- a bunch of these radio pro guys got together. And, and at the very end, it's funny, Steve is asking them to identify, or maybe it's the very beginning. Uh, anyhow, he asked each of them to identify themselves and, and what they have. And they're all explaining the color of their radio pro outfit and everything. And, and, and these guys are big fans of them. You know, they say that, you know, the sound, there's, there's nothing like them. And they're trying to get Steve to get back into it again. But, yeah. Man. So, but, and I want to clarify before, cause you're like, I think you said before that the patent has lapsed, but so Steve Volp could go ahead and bring these back under his own brand, like without PV, right? Like if he wanted mm-hmm. to create it kind of as the inventor, I guess anyone could. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Anyone could make radio pro drum is my understanding. Don't, don't take that as legal advice, advice kids. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, it's my understanding that it, it's pretty much open. And, and Steve, at the time he did that interview, he mentioned he did have like a, at least a five year commitment to the career path that he had chosen. He's uh uh, in a marketing and branding uh, uh, business uh, he, back in Michigan here. I think he's in the Detroit area and works with some uh, music industry companies like ESP Guitars and so on. And uh, so he's he's carved himself another niche that uh, is keeping him uh, going at this point. But it's quite possible that uh, down the road, uh, he said he, ha- he, he made kind of a cryptic mention to, that he has some some concepts and uh, things of things that could be done better and different. And so we'll see. That's great. Yeah. Good for him. I mean, it's hard to be, it, it, it's hard to make something different uh, in general, but especially in drums where, you know, where it actually catches on and gets like a kind of a cult following. So I think it's yeah. great. And I think um, it's really cool to have any kind of different looking drum set that serves a purpose that isn't just different for the sake of being different, but it really does yeah. have like a, a science behind it. Um, so you said it ended kind of in 2000, early 2000s, right? What happens when this, when a drum line or brand sort of dies? Does it just, <laughs> do they say to music stores, sell off what you have? That's it. We're done. Yeah, pretty much. It, it just, uh, uh, or maybe say nothing at all. You know, some companies will issue a press release, but others will just, uh, uh, stop taking orders. <laughs> it disappears yeah. from the catalog, from the website, from the back order printouts, and and so on. And it would have been interesting to see what was actually at the auction. I I missed out on that. I hadn't heard about it. But in uh, uh, 2019, there was a huge auction at that seven acre building, and all manner of stuff was sold. And it did mention briefly in the auction description that there was drum equipment and uh, so I, I don't know if it was manufacturing equipment or actual uh, hardware and all that, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's where the remnants would have been. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. God, that has to be awesome just to go. I love auctions in general and estate sales and any of that, but um, these music auctions, it's kind of a dream come true. Yeah, Carl Dustman, by the way, went to uh, two uh, auctions uh, that were, that were kind of sad in ways. He, he he attended the the auction where all of Tommy Winkler's stuff was sold off, and then uh, he also attended the auction of the offices he had been working in because uh, he was notified in I think in November of uh, '84 that uh, Gretsch had been sold to uh, Baldwin had sold it to Fred Gretsch and he was going to be moving it. Um, down to uh, Savannah <laughs> and where his offices were and or Ridgeland technically. Uh, but so in, in the course of packing up and moving out and everything, they had a huge auction. So uh, two months after he had been going to work there every day, he went back to see the parking lot full of filing cabinets and his desk <laughs> and <laughs> he can buy back his like stapler and yeah. chair. <laughs> Man, that's that is kind of sad, but 
that's business, I yeah. guess you could yeah. say. It, it really stinks for Tommy. I feel like out of this story, Steve sort of got his chance to run it, Steve Volt, but Tommy Winkler seems like a little bit of like, um, but maybe if, maybe Steve was right to say, you know, Rob, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> who, who knows? I, yeah, I could have gone either way. Maybe, maybe he could have brought him out and run it as a, as a company making all the decisions that he wanted to make his own way and, and made it very successful up until the point where some uh, overseas uh, uh, juggernaut decides he doesn't have the money to fight him and, and they just copy it. You know, he, yeah. he, he might've been right to make that call. Yeah. yeah. He, he's happy with his lot in life and uh, has a solid career path. So I don't think he has huge regrets on that. Uh, you can always second guess yourself, but. Oh yeah, of course. No, but that's, it's just a, an interesting story that um, <laughs> I think is just, it's cool to actually know the background and uh, to kind of hear firsthand experience of it. And I mean, like you said earlier, PV is really, it's nice stuff. My, my experience was my brother had a PV, a Minx 110 bass amp growing up. And then we always had a PV Raptor guitar floating around, which mm-hmm. those are both very budget friendly, um, you know, items, but they were fine mm-hmm. when you're 10 years old, 12 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some stuff was uh, kind of subpar compared to the top quality stuff on the market, sure. but they also moved in some other directions. Uh, Media Matrix became a division of PV and they're responsible for huge audio digital mixing systems that are used in airports and everything. They, they've got a huge line array system out now. They've, they've got some pretty sophisticated electronics. Unfortunately, uh, for the workers in the Meridian area, they're they're no longer made in Meridian, Mississippi. A lot of the stuff is uh, is outsourced, but uh, again, that's that's the reality of a uh, a person in manufacturing to make those business decisions and do what's yeah. best for his business. But but he has some very sophisticated products and high quality products, and it's it's an interesting story. Yeah, the the fifty one fifty, the the Eddie Van Halen kind of mm-hmm. amp line that that's always awesome. Um, but wow, okay, cool. Well, I, I said it before we started. I was like, things miraculously kind of get close to sixty minutes, and then we we <laughs> we find a way. But um, all right, so that's awesome. While we wrap up here, um, it's t- today is the day after Thanksgiving, um, twenty twenty, COVID, um. I'm been recently moving. I have my leg in a boot because I tore my Achilles tendon and had surgery. So my world has kind of gone to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> gone to hell. But I, um, I want to know real quick as we wrap up kind of the progress and what your thoughts are on the uh, upcoming 2021 Chicago show, which I'm sure everyone is uh, just mm-hmm. unbelievably h- hopeful that it happens because we, we all want to get back together. But um, you want to touch on that a little bit before we sure. wrap up? Sure. Not really much to say. We're, uh, you can check the Facebook page or the website for any updates that do come along. But but really, we're just kind of uh, uh, at cruising attitude, altitude at this point. Uh, the, the spaces are all assigned. Uh, the exhibit floors are totally booked. I think there's one 10 by 10 space out of 170. And we, we may be able to create a little more space in the central area. Uh, so people can check the exhibitors who are signed up. Uh, we can only hope it's going to happen. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, there's no clinic program. It's kind of a, uh, a throwback show. Uh, and there there is going to be a conference room with some celebrity guests and that sort of thing. But it's, there's not a big formal clinic program, so I don't have all those travel arrangements, uh, flights for the clinicians to worry about uh, booking and canceling and all that. Uh, so we, we just have our fingers crossed. And as long as the, uh, the authorities in charge uh, in, in Illinois and the venue are okay with uh, the show going forward, then uh, we will go forward with it. And uh, if that were to be happening in 60 days, I'd say there's a good likelihood that we would probably have to have our security riding the mask situation and, and keeping people moving in that sort of thing, or making sure that there's not, you know, large gatherings for extended periods of time. But yeah, uh, uh, those, those point, final points of definition will, you know, come into play closer to the time of the show. But 
fingers crossed that by uh, mid-May, uh, there will already be other events happening at that venue and they can give us some guidance and uh, yeah. everything will be good. God, I hope. I mean, it's just... Yeah. And I, I really do hope that this podcast has kind of given people like a feeling of like, you know, uh, hearing from the guys you might meet, like Mike Corrado was just on and like all these people where you might see him at the Chicago show where you kind of, uh, I don't know, you, you give a, <laughs> you get kind of a, a remote version of hearing from you and stuff. But, um, I really hope it happens. And as usual, one thing I love about, uh, this show and the people who listen to the show is they really, really love taking what we talk about and going and buying like books and um, which I think is awesome because in this world, it's a lot of like, you know, not as many people reading and I'm very guilty of it, <laughs> but um, everyone should go to rebeats, R E B E A T S.com. And there's a books tab or you can do rebeats.com slash books, but every really, really cool drum book you could probably want, it'll get you started for a while. There's, there's so many good books a lot that Rob has written himself, like the Rogers book, the Slingerland book, book on calfskin heads. But then on top of that, he has tons and tons of books by other great authors like um, Daniel Glass is on there. Um, Dr. Matt Brennan, who's been on this show multiple times, um, his book is on there. But really, it's like the hub for um, awesome drum books and publications. So um Go and check that out again at rebeats, R E B E A T S dot com. Um, Hal Blaine and the Wrecking Crew. That's got to be a cool one. I'm looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, so, on that note, Rob, um, I just want, I think this is your fourth time on the show, I'm pretty sure. So, that's, uh, it's an honor to have you here per usual. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Yeah, definitely. And, Keep chugging forward on the Chicago show. And I think everyone knows that what you decide in the end is always the right thing for people's safety. I think you should, people know you have their safety in mind. And if it comes to the point where, you know, the world is still upside down and it has to be postponed even further, then yeah. God, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, I, I love the uh, governor of Illinois. Uh, he's much in the pattern of uh, our governor here in Michigan, Governor Whitmer. And I think, uh, they're trying to do the right things for us too. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, this has been, uh, the, the amazing story of, uh, PV drums with we, you know, the flash in the pan. We, we hardly knew ye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, all right, Rob, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much, Bart. I appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history, and please share rate and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.